Hi everybody, this is Bill Knight, and this video is to help prepare you for Quiz 5, which is coming up shortly. Quiz 5 covers Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is entitled, The Production Process, The Behavior of Profit Maximizing Firms. Now on page 148, uh, the author lists three decisions that all firms must make. Number one, how much output to supply? That is, how many units of whatever product you're producing to produce? Second, how to produce that output? That is to say, what production process? Was it, do you want a capital-intensive production process or a labor-intensive production process? What is the best production process? What is the best recipe of resources to use? Should it, whatever we decide to produce, should it be made out of wood or plastic or metal? <clears throat> should it be made mostly by machines or mostly by people or some combination of the two? And then thirdly, how much of each input to demand? Now, all three of these questions are going to be determined by one thing, and that is, what is the profit-maximizing combination of product price and units of output. So we're going to assume that all firms wish to maximize profits. And there is a particular profit maximizing price output combination. It might be to charge five dollars per unit and produce a hundred units of it, or it might be to charge three dollars a unit and produce two hundred units of it. This is the type of decision the firm is going to have to make. And we will see what is involved in that decision <clears throat> in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, and 12. So that's what that is about, finding the profit maximizing output. To maximize profits, you must maximize the difference between revenue and costs. Revenue is price times quantity. Costs, the sum of the payments made to land, labor, capital, and the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur. Don't forget to read the essay in the on the in the course document section entitled Economic versus Accounting Profits. That's very important. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is to learn about costs. We're going to learn about the cost relationships, and that's in chapters 8 and 9. Before we learn about the cost relationships, though, we have to deal with the issue uh, of in chapter 7 and that is to understand the nature of the production process. Chapter 7 is on the production process. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship between inputs and outputs. A production function shows the relationship between the amount of some specific input used in the production process and the resulting amount of output produced. Notice that it shows the units of a specific input. Now in virtually all cases there are more than one input that goes into the production of a good or a service. In, with the production function, though, all other inputs remain constant, but we just change one specific input and note the resulting change on the output. Let's consider in this case that the specific input that we're talking about is, are units of some particular type of labor maybe uh, workers in the warehouse, or perhaps uh, people that are actually directly producing the product, something like that. 
The size of the warehouse will remain constant. The number of forklifts will remain constant. The amount of tools, the available size of the workspace, all of that stuff remains constant. And we're only changing this one specific input, this one specific type of labor. And we're noting the changes in output. It's obvious that when we increase this specific input, the amount of output will also go up. And as you can see, this leads to a positively sloped total product curve. That total product curve there is our production function. The relationship between the units of a specific input and the resulting amount of output produced is direct. The more specific input used, the more output there will be. The less of the specific input used, the less the output will be. You'll notice in this graph that the production function, the total product curve, is positively sloped, and that's because of the direct relationship between the units of the specific input and the resulting amount of output. It is, um, starts at the origin, that is from the intersection of the two axes, because if there's zero units of that specific input, there will be zero units of output. And in this case, it's a straight line, indicating that the relationship between the inputs used and the resulting output is proportional. That is, every additional unit of that specific input will produce the same additional amount of output. In economics terms, the marginal product of each additional unit of the specific input is constant. But now, let's consider the case where the marginal product of the input is no longer constant. In fact, it's diminishing. Now, this is very typical of the production process, and it's known as the law of diminishing returns. You'll note here that, in this case, one unit of that specific input results in 10 units of the output. Two units, however, instead of resulting in 20 units of the output, as it did in the previous case, results in only 17 units of the output. Three units of the input will result in 20 units of the output. Four units will result in 21, etc. Notice here that the marginal product of the additional units of input are diminishing. And that is known as the law of diminishing returns. However, I prefer to refer to it by what I believe is the more technically accurate term, and that is the law of diminishing marginal returns. Because as you are adding more units of the specific input, the total amount of output is going up, not diminishing. It's the marginal returns that are diminishing. Let's look at a schedule, and you might be able to see this more clearly. Let's consider the first case where the production function was a straight line and came out of the origin, which implied, of course, that at zero units of the input, you get zero units of the output. One unit of the input produced 10 units of output. Two units produced 20 units of output. Three produced 30, and four produced 40. But now let's look at the marginal units of the output the marginal units of the output. When we had one unit of input, notice that added 10 units of output. A second, not two, but a second input added an additional 10 from 10 to 20. A third ad added an additional 10 from 20 to 30. And a fourth added an additional 10. You can see that the 
uh, marginal returns to the input was constant, and that's what caused the function to be a straight line. But now let's look at the second case where the uh, production function was flattening out. You can see here that zero units produce zero output, one unit of input produced 10, two units produced 17, etc. Now let's consider the marginal units of the output. One unit of input added 10, a second added 7, a third added 3, and a fourth added 4, uh, 1. You can see that it is the marginal returns that are diminishing, not the total returns. Here is an interesting looking function. Notice that it has two curves. At first, it is rising at an increasing rate, and then, at some point, starts rising at a decreasing rate. The point at which it stops rising at an increasing rate and starts rising at a decreasing rate is called the inflection point. Many, many years ago, when I was taking some math class, I can't remember what it was, I remember the teacher trying to explain how to find the inflection point on uh, such a line. She said, notice that if I were to draw a tangent line to the section where this function was rising at an increasing rate, I would have to put the yardstick below the line. And she had a yardstick in her hand, and she put it below the line, and she drew a tangent. She said, out here, where the line was rising at an increasing rate, at a decreasing rate, I'm sorry, at a decreasing rate, in order to draw a tangent to the line, I would have to put the yardstick above the line. I remember stand, her standing on her toes and putting the yardstick above the line in order to draw a tangent. She said, in order to find the inflection point, think of this. Think of where is the point where you would have to move the yardstick from below the line to above the line? And for some reason, that just somehow stuck with me, and I remembered it for all of these years. So, the point at which it stops rising at an increasing rate, starts rising at a decreasing rate, is called the inflection point. Notice that up until the inflection point, we are experiencing increasing marginal returns from this specific input. Why would we experience increasing marginal returns? It is due most likely to specialization. As we add more units of the specific input, it can become more specialized. And if you check back on the essay entitled The Introduction to Capitalism, particularly in the subsection called The Logic of the Market, you will find three reasons why specialization increases productivity. Go and check back. You'll find three reasons why specialization increases productivity. So here, at low levels of output, we're getting the benefits of specialization, thus leading to increasing marginal returns. Eventually, however, diminishing marginal returns will begin to set in, and that's where we see the function rising at a decreasing rate, diminishing marginal returns. For whatever reason, generally in a production setting, if you start adding more and more and more workers, they might uh, uh, become less productive due to crowding. Imagine trying to set to produce uh, widgets or some output uh, where it is so crowded that your arms are pinned to your side. This is an exaggerated example, of course, but you can see how that would cause diminishing marginal returns to set in. That is, as we add more units of the input, each additional unit of the input will result in less additional output.